All right, we're going to continue our emphasis on um, the Spirit is Lord. And this kind of picks up from the video we watched last week and uh, continues with it. But I want to start off with um, 1 Peter, or the first scripture, 1 Peter um, chapter 5, verse 3. Now listen to what he says here. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. What he's saying, he's to, talking to the shepherds too. That we're to, to, the shepherds are to feed them, lead them, guide them, the whole thing. But what shepherds are not supposed to do is lord it over people. In other words, you're not their lord. <coughs> and we looked at last sat last Sunday that the law is the schoolmaster, the tutor of Galatians 4 that we're no longer under because God has given us His Spirit. And then according to 2 Corinthians 3, 18, 16, 17, 18, especially 16, we know the Spirit is Lord. Now we won't look at, we may look at some of those again just to refresh your memory. But what I want you to see here is the man, we don't lord it over God's heritage. You don't lord it over somebody else. The pastor doesn't mm -hmm. lord it over you because the Spirit has been given. In the Old Testament, Moses told everybody what to do. He was an under-shepherd, under God, and <coughs> was lording it over people. If they didn't line up, they, they were dealt with. And um, so you see that through the Old Testament, because that's all, that's all the law could do. We'll look at that here in a second. Because what I want to do here tonight is show you that men try to lord it over you using the law to lord it over. It would be stupid for me to say, I need you to do this, or you need to do that. Well, you're like, well, who am I, right? Uh, you're, you're, you tell me what to do. Well, then I'll go to the Bible, mm -hmm. and I'll pick out, cherry-pick some scriptures, and then I'll take these scriptures and then coerce you, enforce them, browbeat you with the scriptures. So not only am I being Lord over you, I'm using the law to be Lord over you. And Peter clearly says, we're not into that. Be why? Because the Holy Spirit has been given, and He's Lord. So therefore, we're to encourage you in the relationship that you have with the Holy Spirit who's where? Inside of you. <coughs> so let's look at, um, I think the next scripture is 2 Corinthians 3. Yeah. Now watch, check this out. Um, he says, now, th now remember, this 2 Corinthians 3 is where we find you become as you behold, and we're changing from glory to glory, and that the Spirit is Lord. And that's where we've been. So what I want to do tonight is stay in 2 Corinthians 3, but start at the beginning, and just look at the first, first six verses. Are we beginning to sound like those who speak highly of themselves? Do you really need letters of recommendation to validate our ministry? This is Paul speaking to the Corinthians. He said, like others do, do we really need your, your letter of <clears throat> endorsement? Of course not. For you... For your very lives are our letters of recommendation. Now, another other translations will say, you are living epistles. All right, so he calls you a letter. He calls you an epistle. All right, so this is what Paul's talking about. He's saying, we don't need, what, what's happening here in, in, in the beginning of these verses is that, you know, like you go somewhere and someone recommends you, gives you a letter of recommendation and, and, and people were doing all that. And Paul says, we, we don't need to do that. You're our recommendation. You're our, your life is our letters of recommendation. Permanently engraved on our hearts, recognized and read by everyone. So in other words, you're a living epistle. You're a living letter that something has been written on your heart to make you that living letter, that living epistle. So when you walk out here, people are watching your lives. They're hearing your, your tone. They're, they're looking at your example. And, um, and they're seeing what's inside, what? Coming forth. So how do you get people to act a certain way, respond a certain way? Well, number one, I'm not the Lord to do that. The Holy Spirit is. So when we get people understanding that the Spirit of God is the very Lord in your life, that writes something. Now let's go on. Let's go to the next verse because I don't get ahead of myself. As a result of our ministry... You are living letters or epistles written by Christ, not with ink. Something is written on your heart, and it's not with ink. <clears throat> but who, what's written? But, but how? By what? Spirit. The Spirit of the living God. So why is he using this contrast here? You're going to see nothing but contrast in this chapter. 
So he talks about ink versus spirit. Now, as a letter, you have to write with something that appears on the letter, right? You write something and it appears on the letter and it is read by everybody. So if I write something on a piece of paper with, on, with ink and I hand it to everybody can read that. He's saying, this is not what we're doing. Now, he's contrasting the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, with the New. Because in the Old Testament, what was engraved on stones? Ten the Ten Commandments. Now, that's the finger of God, I guess, that wrote on, on, on that. But they handed down regulations, <clears throat> rules, all that kind of stuff that, that you read on a letter with ink, and you had to obey it with your willpower. We'll talk about that in a second. But he's contrasting here. This isn't how it's working. We're not coercing you. We're not taking the law and browbeating you and trying to get you to do something um, because it's a matter of your heart. Now, remember when we get to, to um, the part in this chapter where it says, when you turn to the Lord, what's taken away? The veil. So the veil is taken off your heart. When you turn to Jesus, the veil is taken off your heart and you have an open face. No longer the law and lies and deceptions and all that kind of stuff keeping you from seeing Jesus and you trying to make it happen on your own. He says what's happening here, we're not doing it with ink, with, with the natural means, but by the Spirit of the living God. Not carved onto stone tablets, but on the tablets of tender hearts. So we're not talking about Ten Commandments on tablets. We're talking about God engraving His very nature, His very purposes, and His Spirit on your heart. It's not an outward thing that you have to, you got to do anymore. Because if it is, then you get lorded by the law and people who are trying to get you to do something. So what we're trying to do is say this, the, the Holy Spirit is Lord and He's riding on your heart. Alright? Now, let's look at this again. As a result of our ministry, <clears throat> you are our living letters written by Christ, not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God. Not carved on the stone tablets, but on the tablets of tender hearts. We carry this confidence in our hearts because of our union with Christ before God. So, um, what we're trying to show you here what Paul is is that the Holy Spirit is not ink written on letters but the Holy Spirit is writing God's life or you could say law but his nature on hearts but you've got to turn to Jesus for the for the heart to be open for the Spirit to come in there and, and move and have, have His... He said this is our ministry. Now, when you read on, we won't look at this, maybe we might next week, but if you read on verses 6 on, He compares the ministry of the Old Covenant with the ministry of the New Covenant. And one kills, one gives life. This is a life-giving ministry, which He says our ministry is this. It's a life-giving ministry. I'm not trying to make you do anything. I'm turning you on to the Holy Spirit who's inside of you. Now watch the next verse. Um, I think it's, it's either Galatians or Romans. When you come over here and do it this way, Paul says, I discovered that the very commandment, now remember commandments written with ink on stones versus the Holy Spirit written on your heart. He says, so I discovered that the very commandment law that was supposed to bring life actually brought death. So that's why Paul will call this a ministry of death. And he's going to call this a ministry of life. Condemnation, righteousness. We've looked at this in the past, but not from this emphasis of the Lordship of the Holy Spirit. Now, um, so when he goes on and, de and de Paul develops this, He'll go on to Galatians 4 and watch this. But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that He might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons, because you are sons. Now watch this. God has sent forth what? Where? Of His Son, where? Where? into the hearts, crying Abba. What I want you to see is the Spirit was sent 
to your heart. That's how you have life, is when the Spirit gets into the heart. And in Ezekiel talks about God, the prophecy of the New Testament, is that, or the New Covenant, when Jesus comes, He will give us a new heart. That's when you turn to the Lord and the veil is taken off your heart. Remember the scripture, your lips are near, but what? Your heart is far away. So in the Old Covenant, their heart is far away. How do you, how do you catch somebody's heart? I can't get in there. And we're not talking about the actual organ. It's the inner man. If you say spirit, I don't know. But it's the, it's the inner. It's not the intellect. It's not the mind. It's, it's where Christ dwells. Out of your belly shall flow rivers. That heart is somewhere, whatever. That it's, a, it's a metaphor. But in, in us, I can't get in there and make you do anything. And that's, that's a trust. Especially when you got kids, teenagers, and then they become adults. You can't make them do certain things. You, you look at someone and go, why don't they do this? Why don't they do that? Pastors look at the... Why don't they do this? You look at the... Why don't he do Nobody... And yet we try to control. And how do we control? There's many ways we try to control. But we don't do it through life. We do it through death. When a woman tries to control her husband or the husband tries to control the wife, all you're doing is, it's called a ministry of death, if you read on here. But if you want a ministry of life, you have to trust the Holy Spirit to write on that person's heart God's ways, God's law, God's nature, the whole thing. We have it. It's written there. It's just, it's just got to come forth. And that's the Spirit's job to do that. Is to, that's why you're not trying to get something out there in there. You're trying to awaken to what's already in there. We call it the life of Christ, the ministry of the Spirit, the new heart. Whatever you want to call it, it's all pretty much the same using different languages. Is this making sense? But what I want you to see is the Spirit is Lord over this process. The church isn't. Man isn't. The Bible isn't. You realize how many times have you, have you read the Bible... And said, so, oh, i got to do that. Or you showed somebody that you knew was wrong. Hey, the Bible says this. You need... How, you can't go to the Bible. You're going to what? Ink. Written on paper. You can't get... I don't... You know what? I can, I can do a little crazy cultic thing here. And I'm going to rip up... I'm going to rip up these pages. And I'm going to make you eat each page. And swallow it. Will that get into your heart? How do I get this in here? I can't. So you see how futile it is for a pastor to enforce this on people? And well, it's the Bible. You no, I, okay, yeah, it's the Bible. You gotta do it. How? What are you saying? You're giving me ink, you're giving me letters. And I'm going to try it. Let's go back to that Romans. I just don't think we, 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 we people believe this. Go back one. I discovered that the very commandment that was meant to bring life actually brought death. So when I take this, the Bible can be, in 2 Corinthians 3, the, this could be the letter of the law. And it kills. When I'm trying to enforce it and coerce it and browbeat you with it to get you to be a certain way, do a certain thing. We give out rules and regulations. Do, do this, don't do that. But that doesn't work. And that's why most of the church is still in sin and the, nobody gets delivered from addiction. Nobody moves. I mean, it's just, we're, we're trying to do this thing with ink and paper, which is willpower and self-effort, working from a, the premise of paper and ink. You've got to do this. You can't read the Bible like that. What you've got to do is understand that the Spirit was given and supernaturally, invisibly, from the inside, He is writing God's ways, God's nature, He's writing it on your heart because the veil has been removed. There's no more veil there on your heart. It's been removed. And go back to the next scripture. He has sent His Spirit. The next one. Galatians. He has sent His Spirit into our hearts. So He's, he's taken the Holy Spirit, according to Paul, and he's, as sons, He's put the Spirit in our hearts. Does that make sense so far? You see where we're going with this. So, again, when the prophet says your lips are near, your heart's far away, the remedy of that, to get the heart near, is to get the Holy, take the veil off and get the Holy Spirit to unveil what He puts on the heart. And that's Christ in you, the hope of glory. So Christ is in you. 
Now remember, we, we could go to Galatians chapter 1, which we've done a million times, verses 15 and 16, where Paul says, God separated me from my mother's womb to unveil Christ, where? In me. So that's the Holy Spirit's job, is that new nature, that new creation, that new heart, that has Christ written on it. The Holy Spirit's, not with ink, not with letter, but with a supernatural union, where you become one with the Godhead, new heart, unveiled, and now the Holy Spirit's bringing what is true of you out of you by unveiling it to you. It's already there. You don't get people in headlocks and try to make them forgive. I mean, how many times people, I, I, I'm not going to forgive. What are they speaking out of? It's their head. Because all they can remember is that dude did me wrong, and there ain't no way in hell I'm forgiving him or her for what they did to me. Now they're speaking out of their unrenewed mind. That's the old man. The old man did. We, we, I mean, it did take a lot for us to forgive. And even then, we probably couldn't. So when you get a Christian speaking out of that and not out of their heart, they're never going to get it until they turn where? To the Lord. When they turn, who is the Lord according to 2 Corinthians 3? The Holy Spirit. When we turn to the Lord, when we turn to the Holy Spirit, who is Lord over that situation of someone doing you harm, that you refuse to forgive, you bring the Holy Spirit into that, you turn to Him, and He says, He's not, He doesn't get you in a headlock and say, forgive, or I'm going to send you to hell. He says, what He does, He comes along inside, and He unveils, forgiveness is already in you. Do you, you realize when you say you can't forgive, you're lying to yourself because the forgiver is one with you inside and all you have to do is turn to the Spirit. He unveils that nature of you that forgives freely. But you've got to get rid of all that crap that makes you not want to forgive. The lies and deceptions. I mean, think of anything that you can't do. It's just your mind's not... You've got to get your mind and your heart connected. And there's a lot about us where our mind is thinking one way and our heart ain't that way. And it takes the Holy Spirit to say, that's not you. And so I really believe we make the law Lord more than we make the Holy Spirit Lord. Because it's easier. It's on paper. I can see it and I can try it and I'll fail and I'll try it again and I'll fail. But to stop that insanity and turn to the Spirit and say, I can't because you have already done it. And you've got to open my eyes to who I now am. What's written on my heart. Okay? Anyway. So, and you can even minister out of your unrenewed mind. You can minister out of ink and letter. What's the Bible say? I was raised under ink and letter. You too. I guarantee you were probably the first church you went to. Or maybe all the churches you went to is inundated with ink and letter. And what is it, what is it prove? What, what does it end up being? Death. That's why this thing does not work. And you end up screwing your life up and you're a Christian. Well, and you, get this, you get this. Well, I thought you was a Christian, man. Yeah, well, I, I am, but I'm a Christian who's full of ink and letter and that's why you're seeing me screw up all the time because that's all I can do. Because it doesn't work. I'm working out of this and this and not out of this where the Spirit is and is Lord. Okay, I'm not going to spend any more time on that, but... So, how does this get worked out? And I've got a bunch of scriptures there that um, I want to run through really quick. And they start with John, chapter 14, I guess. Is that what? Or 13? I don't know, 14? 14, 15, whatever the first series of the John scriptures are. Now, watch what he's saying. Now, under the Old Testament, this, this, is, their, this is their destiny, death. You eat from that tree, what? Die. You die. So everything from that tree and every administration from that tree, every, every commandment, every letter, every, that's all death. So Jesus is going to come and He's going to be the way, the truth, and the... Okay. So He says, and they for three and a half years, you understand, heaven is on earth. No one has seen miracles like this. It's, it's phenomenal. And He comes to them. Now I know we have went through these scriptures. I get that, but... Again, the repeatables is what keeps us um, growing in this. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I... Now, this is the Lord speaking, and He's going to send another Lord. Remember I told you about the, 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 the Hebrew word Yahweh. It can mean God, 
Jesus or the Holy Spirit, but what it does definitely mean is each one of those can be Lord. All right, so nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is your advantage that I, your Lord, go away. Now I'm adding that in there so you can understand where I'm going with this. For if I, the Lord, do not go away, the Holy Spirit helper, Lord, another Savior. Remember we looked at that Sunday? He, the, the Greek is really, when you look at it in the Aramaic, it's an, um, the parakletos is um, an, a, another Savior. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. So he can't send somebody less than him, right? Then they won't have the, su the same success rate. You gotta, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you've seen me, you're going to see the Holy Spirit. If you see the Holy Spirit, you're going to see me. Paul calls the Holy Spirit the Spirit of Christ. Next. However, when He, the Spirit of reality, because that's what truth means, reality. Again, what reality? Are you living God's reality or are you living the, the unrenewed false reality of the first man, first Adam? However, when the Spirit of truth has come, He will guide you into all truth. For He will not speak of His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak and He will tell you things to come. Next, I'm going to try to hurry up through these. And I will pray the Father, and He will give you another Helper, that He may abide with you forever. That's where you get Savior there, another Savior. That He may abide with you forever. If you, that, that, that trips you up, you need to go watch Sunday's message. We explain what that means, another Savior. And I will pray the Father, and He will give you another Helper, that He may abide with you forever. The Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees Him nor knows Him, but you know Him, for He dwells with you and will be in you. That's the key. He's going to come inside you. He's going to come into your heart, and that's where all the transformation and change is going to happen. Next. Was that, what's next? Okay. So, when you get through this, he's, he's, what He's going to do, He's going to take people from the tutor, the um, schoolmaster, also called law. And he's going to take away the law by fulfilling it. Remember what he said. I did not come to do away with the law, but what? Fulfill it and then take it to the cross and it ends. Because Jesus, according to Romans, is um, the end of the law. Okay? Jesus is the end of the law. He's going to replace the law with himself. You want Ten Commandments walking around with you in your pocket? Or you want the actual God of the Ten Commandments walking around with you. And that's what they had for three and a half years. Now they had how many years the law, Ten Commandments, burdening them. Jesus comes and says, I give you rest. What's the difference? It's a huge difference. One, one, Ten Commandments are a burden because you can't do them. And Paul said he found out that what was supposed to give life didn't do it. So it killed. So Jesus is going to come and he's going to fulfill the law for you. And then he's going to remove it and bring you Him. So He replaces the law, but who's going to replace Him? So you see what's happening here. You have the law under the Old Testament, and then in the Gospels you have who? Jesus, who replaces the law. He's the end of the law by fulfilling the law. But then Jesus dies, and in Acts, He sends the Holy Spirit. And it's all the Godhead. God sends the law on the mountain with Moses, and then He sends His Son, and then He sends the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? And the reason He sends the Holy Spirit is because He's got to get inside of you and write that law on your heart. Because that's another fulfillment of, Galatia, of um, Jeremiah. The New Covenant is, I will write the law on your heart. We don't have time to look at those Scriptures, but He says, no one will have to come to you and say, know the Lord, know the Lord. Because that's outward, trying to get you to do something inward. He says, no. He'll write that on your heart. So if anything God wants you to do, whether it's obedience to Scripture or obedience and go over here, go over there, His promise is He'll write that on your heart where it will become now a drive and a new desire that you'll want to do. What you didn't want to do at one time, now you want to do because of the transformation that's happening as He unveils Christ in you. What's been written on your heart. Does that make sense? Alright, so watch this. But if you are led by the Spirit who is Lord, you are no longer under law, which was the tutor and schoolmaster in the Old Testament. Law was your Lord. You bow or you die. Under the New Testament, the Spirit is the Lord. So what we have here is the Paraclete Spirit replaces the paragogue, the, the law. 
pedagogue, however you want to pronounce that. Okay, what's next? All right, now watch this. All who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Now, where I want to go with this, just keep that up there, because I'm going to, is how he does this is John 14, and this is what we looked at in the video last week, where he said, in that day you will know that I'm in the Father, and the Father's in me, and I'm in you and you're in me. Okay? So that's the Holy Spirit. Because that's when He sends the Holy... Remember He said, He says, the Holy Spirit's with you, but will what? Be in you. That's, that's Acts. That's Pentecost. So we're going to see that in that day, you're going to realize the Holy Spirit is now in you. turn to the Lord, the veil was taken off, and, the, and you're going to see the Spirit of God in you. Does that make sense? Now, when you do that, when He sees that in John 14... Again, this is repeat. John 14 is you're going to find union. Pretty much union. I and you, you and me. Now he's going to show you what that looks like in John 15 by looking at the trees, agriculture. He's going to say, look at the trees. If you abide in me, then you're going to have the fruit come out of you. And the word abide is remain. So if you look at a tree, what's a tree doing? What's the limbs doing? The branches. You're the vine, I'm the vine, you're the branch. The branches abide, remain connected. There's a connection there. As long as that connection is there, the flow is coming through. But if the branch refuses the flow of the tree, if these branches refuse what's coming up into them, making them branches, then they can't produce fruit. So if these branches get like, well, what's going on over there? Or, they, or these branches go back to the, to the law because they're under religious bondage or so, went to a church that's still under religious bondage. The minute you, this is the, you have the union, you have the Holy Spirit in you to lead and guide you to all truth. And so you abide in the Spirit. He's going to put the Spirit in you. You're going to be one. And then He's going to give you the illustration of how, what you're supposed to do once you're in Christ, in the Spirit. And walking in the Spirit, which we already saw. Walking in the Spirit is abiding in the vine. So what it simply is, that remember it's just a simple turning to the Lord and the veil gets removed. A simple turning away from the Lord, what gets put back? Has to. Well, what kind? Any veil. There's a million veils out there. Pick your, pick your poison. There's a million veils out there. You want to sit under false teaching of any sort? The, anything that doesn't come from the Holy Spirit is a veil. Because the Spirit's into removing veils. The world and religion is into putting veils on. So if the focus of the, bra the branch is inward, no, no sweat. Piece of cake. How do I know that? Do you see a tree out there grunting and sweating to produce apples? What's it doing? Rest. I mean, you, you, it's, you, it's peaceful. And Jesus says, Come unto me, all that are weary, heavily, and I will give you, you rest. This is why you cease from your works in Hebrews 4 and enter into what? Rest. So you just rest. Abiding and remaining is simply you recognize the one where rest is found. Or get into work and go out there and try to make something happen, and then you're not resting, are you? You're out there trying to make stuff happen. You're trying to make stuff happen in your life rather than trusting Him to do it for you and through you. So He gives you that. So then when you get to John 16, He goes back and teaches on more about the Holy Spirit. In a nutshell, pretty much. I mean, there's all kinds of things in there. Then He ends in the, in the high priestly prayer of John 17, washes their feet in 13. All these run together uh, in that one night before He's betrayed. Okay? But I want you to see the key here of walking in the Spirit is John 15. Let me just say this. You see this, this scripture in Galatians. Walk in the Spirit. I correlate that to John 15. Also, in 2 Corinthians 3.18 where he says, you behold, by, you become by beholding. We look into the mirror, remember that? That's also John 15. What is this, what is this branch doing? This is the picture of John 14, 15, 16. It's the picture of how to walk in the Spirit, and it's the picture of how you behold and become. John 15, there is absolutely nothing but recognizing who's in you. Remember, in that day you will know. 
that I'm in you, you're in me. You recognize that and rest in that. The Spirit does the work. Because He's Lord. He's Lord over every aspect of your life to lead, to guide you, to even transform you. Where the church has tried to lord it over you, and Peter says, we don't lord it over you, because the Holy Spirit is Lord who has been given to you. Now, I add that in there, that's what, but that's what it is. Now, look at Galatians 5. Do I have, uh, yeah, look at Galatians 5. Is that what's next? If not, just get down to Galatians 5. Yeah. No. 5, yeah, 5.18. Now look at this. So I say walk by the Spirit. Okay, now what are we saying? When we say walk by the Spirit, what's, what, what's the two scriptures we've correlated? As you behold Him, you become Him as He is, John, 1 John, so are you, right? So as I behold Him, I'm seeing who He is and becoming that simply by beholding Him. Okay? Simply by resting in Him, I'm producing His life through me by trusting His life in me. Now when you get over here, walk by the Spirit, you will not what? Gratify the desires of the flesh. That unrenewed mind, that old way of thinking, that old Adamic man you thought you were, that you've been delivered from. Now watch. Desires of the flesh, the fruit of the Spirit is going to come. And what is the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law because it all comes by who? So you want to you love? Do you understand the only love that God accepts is His love flowing through you? Galatians, or Romans 5 says the love of God has been shed abroad where? In your hearts. There we go back to the heart. So let's just look at the first one. The very one that's the most important thing the Bible really pulls out. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is what? Love. Now watch. You can't love unless you love out of the love that's been poured into you. So He gives you love to love with. Not the love you were raised with to give. That screws everything up. I mean, that kind of love is vengeful. That kind of love is unforgiving. There's three kinds of love, basic three kinds of love, is the agape love, which is what? Unconditional. Then there's um, phileo, and that's the friendly love. And eros, I don't even think it's in the Bible, but that's a Greek um, love, and that's lust. Where you lust for one another. Um, and I definitely don't want to do that. But even the friendly love can be conditional. If you, if you as a friend treat me right, I as your friend will treat you right back. You screw me, I may end up screwing you back. But that doesn't, agape does not operate like that. Agape is a man on the cross getting the crap beat out of him and he's going to die from their, their beatings and he's going to say, Father, forgive them. That's agape. And that's unconditional. Now the only way you and I can pull that off is when the Spirit in us unveils that and produces that in us or through us to others. So when you say, I can't love that person, you're right, lie, lie, lie. Believe the devil's lie. Because the love of God has been shed abroad in your hearts. It's in there. You just got to turn to the Lord, the Spirit, who will unveil that, show it to you, make it happen, and as you rest in Him, he, His job is to produce that. Do you, remember what I said Sunday morning, last week. I said that, that one word, I don't have time to look up the notes, but you've got to watch Sunday morning. I said that Aramaic word for the Holy Spirit means to end the law and all the effects of it. Well, there was no hate in the garden. So hate is a result of the curse. And the Holy Spirit has come to end the curse. Jesus ended it on the cross. But the Holy Spirit has given to remove all the effects of, of the curse. And in many ways, just not giving us the fruit of the Spirit, but to heal us, to make us whole mentally, physically, emotionally. The Holy Spirit's job in you as Lord is to reverse the curse. That's, I, I can't say it any clearer than that. There's all kinds of... But to just say it clearly is to reverse the curse. And if you don't let the Holy Spirit lead and guide you into that, His ministry is to reverse the curse. Every act that, to end the curse in your life. 
So you're not walking in all that crap anymore because you've been delivered from it. And when you're still in it, it's simply because you haven't turned to the Lord, the Holy Spirit, Lord, to work that through you. You're not walking in the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit is not just something you do once. It's, it's your way of life now because you're one with the Spirit. He who, 1 Corinthians six seventeen. He who is joined to the Lord, one Spirit. And it, now it, it, it takes time because veils are still on our, over, over our eyes and on our hearts. And, but it doesn't mean that that's not been written there. That's the beauty of it. I mean, one guy gives an illustration. He said, there's some liquids, some fluids that you can write with and, and, and you can't see it. It's on, you can write it with pa on paper, but you can't see it. You need a chemical to be put on that paper for the fluid to show it, or the sun has to be on certain fluids to show it. But there's some fluids that you can write with that's invisible. You can't see it until something's applied to it. Like I said, um, a chemical or a or sun well it's just like you you can't see who you are as a lover of god or there's joy in you and you may be the most depressed person in the world and someone says joy is in you and you've been depressed all your life and you're on um, pharmaceuticals it's like because it's written there invisibly and you don't know it and you need someone to come alongside and open your heart up to you of what and who's that the Holy Spirit. So just as there's visible things you can write with, that is invisibly written on your heart, but it's the Holy Spirit's job to illuminate what is already in the new creation, what has been written on the heart. It's done! I mean, all these things, love, joy, things that you, do you realize, I don't know about you, I'm 61 years old, and all I want is love, joy, peace. And I'll take the rest too, but these three ones, man, get, I just want peace. I want joy. I'm a, look at the garbage happening in this world. If this election is not dragging you down, it's because you're not watching it. Thank God for it. But the little tiny bit I just try to keep, oh my God, help us. And the answer is in Christ. It's not, that they're not, they're not the answer. That's what gives me the, all right, I'm cool, is because they're not the answer. I'm watching the blind lead the blind. It's called an election, and it's called voting. Sorry, it's what it is. When you go through that every four years, it's the blind leading the blind, and the blind vote in the blind. Because my kingdom is not of this world. The answer is in your sonship. The answer is in the Spirit of God in you. The answer is in the kingdom. Just as a sidebar. Yeah. Now let me show you this. I'm going to hurry up. We're doing good on time. But I think Matthew 14. Now keep this John 15 picture in, in view. Because that's the picture he wants to show you how this gets worked out. Now Jesus and his disciples, three and a half years ministering, and then John 14, 22, 23, watch this. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat. Now, he made them. He, because he's Lord. He made them get into the boat. Okay? Why? Just, did he just, is that just a whim? Just, I got, I got an idea. Get in the boat. Every one of you, get in the boat. Okay? Then what? And go to the other side. While he sent them to the other side, he sent the multitudes away. Get out of here. Now watch this. You get in the boat. You all out. Is that what? I mean, I'm being, but he put some flesh and blood on this. What's he actually doing? He wants, he wants his 12 away from him. Get out of here. And he wants the multitude to get out of there. Sounds like to me he wants to be alone. I'll catch up with you guys on the other side. You, tw you multitude, you just go. Oh, let's read it again now. Immediately. Now, which I find that interesting. Something hit him that made him go, okay, we're stopping what we're doing. You guys get in the boat 
go over there and you all that I'm healing and raising dead and doing all kinds of miracles, I want you all to go immediately. Why? Remember he gets baptized in the Spirit where the Spirit comes on him and it says, immediately I think, or right, I think he uses the word immediately, the Holy Spirit sent him to the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. As soon as that dove comes on him, the Spirit leads him to the right off the bat. Okay? Goes into the wilderness. So what? Because the Spirit is Lord. And Jesus is not going to disobey the promptings of the Spirit that has been given to him. Because it is the Father's and the Spirit working with him. That's, the, that's again, the Trinity. They, they, they are all in sync together. So what the Father does, the Spirit reveals and the Son obeys. So as soon as Jesus is hearing the Spirit, He knows it's from the Father. He communes to the Father by way of the Spirit. So when the Spirit says, go up to the wilderness, He went. Here, He hears the Spirit. He does not do this on His own, right? How do I know? He says, I don't do anything on my own, but what? what? I see my Father doing. So He saw the Father do this by way of the Spirit, and so immediately, I mean, he's in the middle of ministry. And all of a sudden, something says, stop. Get them out of here, and get them out of here. You, you see that? Am I making that up? Yes, that's right, I see it. He sent the multitudes away, and when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now, who is he praying to? Now when the evening came, he was alone. Now, here's where I'm going to take a twist. And because this is what I'm going to drop in your, in this, we're going to develop this way down the road, but I'm, I always try to give you a little bit of what's coming. So what's happening here is that he's, and I want you to put flesh and blood on this. I want you to be the multitude he sends away. Okay? So you're in line, and you're about... Ten, ten people back. And everybody that you've seen so far has gotten healed. And you're with your spouse or your mother or your dad. And they need healed. And you've seen every single person get healed. And, and, and you're like, oh man, they're getting healed today. And you're just waiting in line as he's laying hands on people, right? Your mother or your whoever comes up next and the Spirit says, send them away. You've got to be kidding me. That means from your mother or your spouse or whatever, all the way back, ain't getting healed. And He can do it. That doesn't sound fair, does it? He did that a lot. He walked away. Why would you walk away when so many people need healed and fed and this, that, and the other? You're, I mean, Acts 10, 30 says He went about doing good. If you leave, you won't do any more good. You'll be so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good, Jesus. You hear that one? But what, what was going on here? Now, put a pause on that. If you remember everything we've said on this, this series... Remember how Moses had to go up on the mountain? Remember you have to shoulder that thing yourself. Right? You've got to get in the presence. You've got to have a one-on-one. -on -one because while Moses is up there on the mountain with his one-on-one -on -one and the glory getting all over him, what are they doing on the ground? Building a golden calf. And I promise you that if Jesus did not do this, he'd make an idol out of the ministry. Because he would burn out. He needed to get away from... How many times... Let's just look at the natural. How many times do you feel like in the natural, get me the hell out. I've got to go be by myself. I can't take you. I, can't, I like you, but today I don't. I love this job, but today I'm leaving early. I can't take this crap anymore. And you're on, you're on edge. You've got no patience. You've got nothing left for the people that are around you. And I guarantee you they were wearing on him. And if he didn't go up on that mountain and get in the presence of the Lord and get recharged or refilled or whatever, the, whatever words you want to use to get, that, to, to, to get all that off of Him and get the presence. You can go back and use the... Remember the manna? Remember the manna? 
go out and get enough manna for the day, but if you get too much manna, think that you're going to carry it over for the next day. How many times do you do, you do this? It's the nature of man. You go to the grocery store and you get enough for the week because you want to go back there every day. Right? You just get enough or at least get you through three or four days because you don't want to go there every day and you don't want to go there twice a day. And they're like, why can't we just have... Why can't we get enough for a couple of days? We won't have to come back out here. Because that's a picture and a type that you have to stay. What does it mean to you? Walk in the Spirit. Is that just whenever you want to? Or is that a way of life? So the walk in the Spirit is to be in the presence of the one you're walking with. And so you, what you're doing is, Jesus says, i got to get up to that mountain. I got to be with the Father. I got to hear what He's saying. I got to hear what He's doing. I got to be empowered. I got I got to have every grace possible in me by way of the Spirit. Or if I go back down there, I may know may not want it. Or again, I say He would have made an idol out of ministry. Maybe not, but we would. I promise you, man will. If man doesn't stay in the love relationship of abiding presence, if he doesn't remain in this right here, John 15, he's going to minister law. He's going to minister his, his weakness. He's going to minister his impatience. He's going to, you ever heard a preacher and he's really, he really truly is angry. You're like, man, what side of the bed did he wake up on? Man, what did his wife do to him this morning? He, is, he's not, he don't like anybody. He's not ministering out of grace. You may not have seen that, but I've seen it many times. Um, your pastor's not in a good mood. How'd that happen? How spiritual burnout happened? Because you're so busy with the... Again, proof positive to prove this is the church at Ephesus. I know your works. They're good. They're good. But you left your first love. And I don't care about those works. I care about the heart. Your heart where I'm at. That you stay sensitive. And you stay tender. And you stay loving. And you, you flow out of me, not out of, out, of, out of disconnecting from me, and then flesh. Is this making sense? So you ever get to your, you ever look at your husband and you look at your wife or look at your kid, and you're like, you're ready to strangle them. This is, I mean, you may not want to admit this, but how does 50% plus end up in divorce if I'm not talking truth here? It's because you've had enough. And you will always be pushed to the place of having enough. People quit their jobs every day. People leave their spouses every day. People murder every day. People fight every day. People can't... And look, look, road rage. You can't even accidentally pull out in front of somebody afraid that, my God, what, you know, they're all over your bumper. Flipping you the, that finger all over the place. You're like, God, calm down. Or maybe you're the one that got pulled out and you're all over them, flipping them the burden off. What's happening? All I'm saying is, when, when, if, you don't, if you don't get to the place where you're walking in the Spirit, and that's relationship. That's not a formula. Because the last thing I want you to get out of this is, oh, i got to go up on the mountain to get anointed to come down here and do great works. Now, now you're merchandising the relationship. So you got to get that out of your head. But I'm telling you, that's the result when you're not up on the mountain. You're going to burn out on the ground. And you're going to make idols. It's going to be about money. It's going to be about numbers. It's never going to be about people anymore. And you will definitely lord it over God's heritage. Because you don't, people are just a number. This, is, this, this will save you from crap, all kinds of crap in the future if you remain in... This is what he's saying. If you remain in me. You'll produce the life of Christ, which is this, by, by way of the Holy Spirit. That he'll be writing this stuff on your hearts. It will, he's the, it, it's rest. It's not something that you've got to try to do. It's something that He does through you. Now you can look at the ten virgins. Remember five had oil and five didn't? Or you can look at the, Lord, did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not raise the dead? These people had a ministry. And he's like, there's no love minute. There's no love here. You're doing this, you're doing this now on your own. This is this I, I equate Matthew 7, Lord, did we not? And he says, I never knew you to the Ephesians church and the Laodicean church. 
You can, be, you can be truly saved and doing your own thing, born again, and you, he, he doesn't know you because you left his first love. And he would for, he'll, go, he'll forego your ministry, your, your success. He'll forego all that to get your heart back, to, t- to keep your heart tender before him in love. Because if it is, then it will be before people. Because isn't this what it's all about? People. We are the body of Christ. The many membered, jointly fitted together. And if we're not getting along, a kingdom divided can't what? Stand. And we're divided all over the place. We're, the nation's divided. The churches are divided. Division is the name of the game. Anyway, I thought that was interesting. That Jesus, ha- if Jesus had to get away... To keep his heart pure, to keep his heart tender, whatever you, you know, so he could come. There's a reason he had to get away, and he did it often. And when you're feeling like, you've got to stop and go get away. And not for a week, not for, you don't got to get on vacation. Just get away for a few minutes, turn to the Spirit, and as quick as you turn, I told you about that guy, him and his wife had that knockdown, drag out fall, that pastor from Delaware. I mean, he said something in him was saying, stop it, don't say nothing else. And he couldn't stop. And the more he talked, the, the worse the fight was getting. He said, this voice says, shut up. He said, but I couldn't. And, it, and man, it just got, and finally he just had some, I don't know, the Holy Spirit. And he said, let's stop, stop, stop. Give me 40 seconds. He left the room for 40 seconds. She didn't know what he was doing. He comes back in, calm, cool, collect. Stopped it all. Who knew where that fight would have... How many fights, if they don't end, someone will be killed? Domestic violence. Someone's going to get hurt. If someone doesn't rise up and put bring peace to the situation when it's war, and that is so easy... I'm telling you, it's a lie to think, I can't, I can't stop my... All you got to do is know the truth. And the truth will what? Set you free. So you're not in bondage to this war that's happening here. Whether it's road rage or what, just walk away. Just go to the Lord. Just get, get the mind of Christ. You can get it in 40 seconds. You can get it in 10 seconds. It's, it's just turning to the Spirit. And believe you me, it's quick. You go, oh my God, what was I thinking? It's almost like you were under a spell and boom, something broke that spell. Well, you were under a spell. But the Spirit comes and says, that's not who we are. You turn to the Spirit and you get the grace of the Spirit. And guess what? Love comes, wherever that, wherever that verse went. Love comes. Joy comes. Peace comes. That's a fruit of the Spirit. If he, I'm telling you, in your worst time, if He doesn't show up, when you turn to Him and He doesn't show up to bring peace, calm, or joy, or whatever to that situation, He ain't doing His job. Well, it's a pro. No, it's already on your heart. He just has to unveil it and bring it forth. Boom, it's there. That's the lie of religion. That you're not, not you, not yet. Yeah, you now. You have it all. Christ in you. You've got the fullness of the Godhead in Christ, and you've got Christ living in you. You've got the whole Godhead living, and you, and you, He don't have enough power to stop you from making the worst mistake in your life. You just don't know that, and you make the worst mistake in your life. Because you don't know the truth. Religion is telling you, nah, you got, you're, you're a sinner and you've got a, lot, you've got a long ways to go. So you expect to screw up. This is the, to me, this is where the rubber meets the road on the Lordship of the Holy Spirit. Because when you make the law Lord, all it's going to do is make you worse than what you are and bring death into the situation. So let's close with this. Uh, just go find 2 Corinthians 3. And we'll close with that. I just, want, I just want to reiterate this. It's probably the last verses. I don't know. Alright. But the moment one turns to the Lord. I showed you Sunday that that's re- the word turn is return. But the moment one returns to the Lord with an open heart, the veil is lifted and they see. Now, the Lord... I'm referring to, Paul speaking, is the Holy Spirit. 
And wherever he is Lord, there's freedom. While you're fighting, you're in bondage to that anger. You can't stop it. You're in, if you're in the middle, you can't stop it. But he says where the Spirit is Lord, there's liberty. There's freedom. You don't have to be and do the things that's happening to you that's not the fruit of the, fruit of the Spirit, walking in the Spirit. So where, where the Spirit is Lord, there is freedom. Next. We can all draw close to Him with the veil removed from our faces, and with no veil we all become like mirrors who brightly reflect the glory of the Lord Jesus. We are being transfigured into His very image as we move from one brighter level of glory to another, and this glorious transfiguration comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So as you, as you turn to Him, He unveils you, not fighting, you being a lover. Even if He has to remind you of this message. That's renewing the mind. But it's coming from your heart. It's coming from where who you... All the truth... Isn't it amazing that you read this Bible, but everything here and more is already in here? That's why... I mean, what do people like... Oh, you got to have that Bible. I, believe me, I love this Bible as much as anybody else, but what do you do if the country you live in bans this and you don't have one? It's in you. And He will bring to remembrance... Those things you need to know. He'll unveil it. He doesn't need all of this. He just needs that relationship going. And he'll tell you everything you need to know in life. Thank God for this. But you know there's so much more. Many things I want to say to you. Many things I want to say to you. And a lot of it ain't in here. It's for you personally. For your personal life. For direction and guidance to you. You can't do it. He's your personal GPS. You can't get lost when you're walking in the Spirit. Think about that. You can't get lost. You can always be on the right path and be at the right place at the right time when you're walking in the Spirit. When you're not, you're gambling. You'll be at the wrong place, maybe at the right time, or be at the right place at the wrong time. But you will not be at the right place at the right time. So, with this in mind, what I want to leave you with is He is Lord, not the law, and not other people. Don't let anybody tell you what to do. I'm telling you, there are churches that rule with a rod of iron. You can't have a ministry, personal ministry, unless they okay it. And if they don't okay, I guess you can't do it, although the Spirit told you to do it. Or you decide that you're going to move your family down south because you can't make money here and your pastor says you ain't going nowhere. You don't think this stuff happens. You don't think it's happening right now. It's horrible. It's happening in this city and many churches because I hear it all the time. Lording it over God's heritage with a, with a, rule, of, with a rule of iron, man. A rod of iron. Rather than saying, hey... I, if that's what the Spirit's saying to you, we bless you. Or, or, or someone comes to you and says, hey, we're leaving the church. We want to go to this church. Well, then, I can't bless you because you're leaving me. And you're going to Him. Wait, what? No, you're going to Him. I can't bless you. So if I stay, you'll bless me. Yeah. <laughs> if they would just stop and just li listen to themselves. This is a true story. I, don't, I lie not. Okay, I guess I'm not getting blessed then. I guess you're going to get mad when we leave, and if I see you at Kroger's, you won't say a word to me. You'll walk right, you'll just snub me, although I've given all my tithes and offerings for 20 years. I've served this place, but you're going to snub me when I'm in Kroger because you won't bless me because I'm no longer in your church. I thought we was all working for the same God, the same team. This is all because we're not under the Lordship of the Holy Spirit. There is so much more on this. I, I wear you out. i got 20 parts on this. I just wear you out because I've got so many angles to show you how we're missing it and how this thing is just... He, 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 the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to say this for last, has been put in a corner and we'll call on you when we need you because you're not Lord. I'm going to do what I want to do, when I want to do it, and how I want to do it. And I'll call on you when I need to speak in tongues. I'll call on you when I need a, a power gift to operate in. Or I'll, I'll call on you when I want to prophesy. 
Other than that, stay in your own lane. Uh, is that being mean? I'm telling you, that's the truth. He is not Lord. And we're not walking in the Spirit. Because pe Christians, forget the world, they don't know anybody. Christians are full of hate and unforgiveness. They're mean. How does that happen? Because the law is their Lord. And the law kills. It makes people meaner than rattlesnakes. And unforgiving and unbending and hard. Uh, that's not the that's not the ministry of the, that's not the ministry of the spirit and that's all in Second Corinthians chapter three. Any questions or comments? I will say this is all by faith because this is one point I want to make. And I'll be out of here in three minutes. Habakkuk says the just shall live by faith. Paul grabs that Old Testament scripture. And he, pre he presents it to the Romans in 117, the just shall live by faith. He, present, he presents it in, in, in Galatians, what, 3 maybe, the just shall live by faith. And in Hebrews 10, he'll say it again, the just shall live by faith. Here's the guy who writes two-thirds of the New Testament, pulls out an Old Testament scripture, and it is his, it, it's his main scripture. Because Galatians and Romans and Hebrews, they're huge. You, those three books you want to know. Well, what's it mean the just shall live by faith? Not your faith. You're going to live by faith, meaning this. You're going to trust the one who's in to do the work. Uh, you, you, you should be no problem walking in the Spirit. Faith's response to the truth is, the Spirit is in me. And I'm going to walk in Him because He's Lord. I'm going to turn to the Spirit. All I'm doing is trust. It's not my work. All I'm doing is, what's it say? Go back, go back one. What's it say here? The moment one turns. <coughs> you can't turn? And guess what? Who's the one causing you to return? He gives you the grace to turn, and once you turn or return, He gives you the grace to do that, and then He graces you for doing it. Because it's all He knows that it's... All he's the Lord. He's the Lord. It's all it's all of him and none of me. Okay? He's in me. It's part, I, I, I co labor with it. It's not like I'm just sitting over here as a dead I'm, you know, weekend at Bernie's and he's doing it all and I'm just tagging along as a dead man. No, I'm much alive. And I'm very part. When he loves, I'm loving with him. He's lo as a matter of fact, when you see my acts of love, it's him loving in me, through me, and I get to do it with him. Anyway, questions or comments? Can you see why on... I remember when, when I put that sign up at the church in 1998. And it says Restoration Church. Still there. And then it says where the Spirit is Lord. And it's from this. And you wouldn't have any people say, what does that scripture mean? Well, what do you mean? What's that mean, Spirit is Lord? They couldn't swallow it. They couldn't, they couldn't handle it. They didn't have a revelation of it. Because they didn't have a revelation of the Trinity. And I guarantee you, if they didn't know what that meant, guess who's not Lord? You have to see the Holy Spirit as Lord. And like, Remember, immediately, He stops what He's doing. When you walk in the Spirit like that, and the Spirit says, don't go there. Make a right. Don't say that to him. Say this. I mean, are you ready to hear like that? Because he's there to do this. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be honest. I'm, uh, everything I've done that's screwed up and ugly and evil, and there's a guarantee that it's a result of me not hearing him and walking in him, doing my own thing. Whether it's out of ignorance or rebellion or stubbornness, it is what it is. But when you get older, older, you're like, I think I need to listen a little more. And then when you get your eyes open, oh my God, He's Lord. He's just not there to help. He is Lord. You know, it's almost like if God came down, you'd, you would listen. Thundering from Mount Sinai, God speaking. Man, you, you, back of your hair on the neck. Was, or if Jesus came, 
and stood right here in our midst with the robes on and his long hair. And we, you wouldn't leave at 8.05. In fact, you probably would want to pull it all nighter, right? Come on, let's, let's really be honest with ourselves. That would be true. If, yeah. if the voice from the Sinai came down and, and, sh and shook this place, you'd fall to your face. Oh my God, what's God saying? What's God? Or if Jesus walked and we all fell down from his presence and got back up and man, people are healed. And yet we have one just as great, just as mighty, who is also Lord. And we yawn. And we go do our own thing. That's how far removed we are from understanding that the Spirit is Lord. I'll leave you with that.